in 2021 in Presque Hill County, Sheboygan County, any surrounding county, wherever you work, wherever you go, what we need is conviction in your message. And Jesus still saves in 2021. Is I want to talk about distractions. I want to talk about distractions. You reap a harvest where you place an emphasis. You reap a harvest where you place an emphasis. It doesn't matter if that's church. It doesn't matter if that's at home. It doesn't matter if that's at work. Oftentimes businesses, they'll say, okay, here's what we want to target. And so they target something in, in particular, and they'll notice uh, that they are maintaining or gaining some success in that area because they emphasize that area. And it's no different in our Christian life. You reap a harvest where you place an emphasis. The devil does not want you to have success in your life. The devil does not want you to have success in your family. And one of the big things that Satan is going to use is he's going to use distractions. He's going to use distractions to keep you from having that steady, regular rhythm in your Christian life. So let's just look at scriptures and uh, we'll use that as our springboard out of the book of Luke chapter number 10 where the Bible says in verse number 40 and the story here is that Jesus is going to spend some time in the house of some friends. And the Bible tells us that he spent many happy moments uh, in these friends house I believe their house was in Bethany. And uh, his friends are Martha, Mary, and Lazarus. So here's Jesus at their house. And let's go to verse 38. Now it came to pass as they went, he entered into a certain village, and a certain woman named Martha received him into her house. And she had a sister called Mary, which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. Now how cool would that be? To literally be sitting at the feet of Jesus, hearing what Jesus had to say. Oh, what a privilege. But Martha was cumbered about much serving. She wanted to be a good host. So here's Martha, she's running around and you know, she's got a cake in the oven and she's trying to do the dishes and uh, she forget, f remembers that she wanted to tidy up the bathroom real quick. So she runs in there and, and then she sees a pile of uh, uh, Mary's clothes that she left in the corner. She hangs them up real quick, puts them in the closet. And she's just back and forth, back and forth. And Mary is just sitting at Jesus' feet, listening to what Jesus has to say. And I am sure as I can be that... Martha's getting a little bit ticked off because Mary's not doing anything. All she's doing is just sitting there while she is busy getting everything ready. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, dost thou not care? <laughs> this is one of the few instances where somebody is chewing out Jesus, then that's what's happening here. Lord, dost thou not care that my sister hath left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, that she help me. <laughs> Make her get up and help me, because I want to be a proper host. Jesus answered and said unto, Martha, unto her, Martha, Martha, Thou art careful and troubled about many things. Uh, Martha was a worrier, and she was a doer. And she wanted to be a good host, and she wanted to make a good impression. And she didn't want Jesus to think that she was not hospitable. She was also worried that she was doing too much, and Mary wasn't doing enough. But one thing is needful. And Mary hath chosen that good part. And boy, did Martha get a shock when Jesus said, No, I'm kind of agreeing with Mary here. She's doing the right thing, and I appreciate what you're doing, but 
You didn't choose the best part. She had chosen that good part, which shall not be a taken away from her. If I were you and I were, had young children at home, I would draw a big circle around that last phrase, which shall not be taken away. There's always going to be laundry. There's always going to be dishes. There's always going to be a Florida mop. The toaster is always going to leave a bazillion crumbs on the countertop. Always. The kids are always going to miss the trash can. So there's always going to be some slop on the wall. Uh, if you have boys at home, the bathroom's always going to be in need of cleaning. Always. I don't know why that is, but that's very specific to boys and men. The laundry is always going to need to be folded. The bills are always going to need to be paid. Clothes are going to need to be put away. These are things that are routine to life. But I want to talk tonight about distractions and the things that keep us from the most important things. The needful thing. Father, help us as we focus our attention for the next few minutes on the needful things. We ask it in your name. Amen. Today's believer is plagued with many things. There's turmoil in the world around us. It seems like at the workplace there's chaos, there's confusion. Uh, we got schedule conflicts and we're trying to work stuff out. And the truth is God never intended for his children to run around like chickens with, his head, with their heads cut off. We have more technology than we've ever had before, and it's not making our life simpler, it's making our lives more complicated. God never intended for a church to be a place where there's a lot of busyness, but where the needful things are not happening. God never intended for our home to be a place where married people uh, just stop and go, and that's what it feels like sometimes. That's the place where I eat and sleep, but really nothing meaningful happens at home. God never intended for his children to go for days and days without spending time, meaningful time, with him. In a day and age where technology has created so many ways to connect with so many people across many platforms and are literally around the world, we're in Haiti, driving through Haiti. We went from south uh, East Haiti drove all the way to Northwest Haiti in one day, about 12 hour trip. And we are in the middle of Haiti where there's nothing. People are carrying water on their heads. They're carrying bundles of sticks. But they have cell phones. That's going to make their lives better. I saw a little cartoon clip many years ago that said this. There's a guy sitting on a park bench talking to the guy next to him. He said, I chatted three hours last night from a man, with a man from India, but I haven't met my neighbor yet. It isn't that typical of the age we live in. So Martha was cumbered. She was troubled. Verse number 40. But Martha was cumbered about with much serving. That word cumbered means to draw around, to draw away, to distract, to be driven about mentally. To be distracted, to be overoccupied, too busy about something. And that was Martha. She's running around. She's like, hey, I could use a little help here. She's trying to get everything. And Martha's just a good example of us. Distracted. So a couple things that I think can help us when we think about this matter of distraction and the things that take us away from the needful things. The things that take us away from the good part. The things that can take us away from the things that will not be taken away from us. Number one, acknowledge the problem of distractions. Acknowledge the problem. We live in such a fast-paced world. The phrase multitasking was not even heard of 25 years ago. That phrase did not exist. We have risen to a level of doing literally everything all at the same time while accomplishing nothing. According to scientists, 
The age of smartphones, this is a quote from an article, according to scientists, the age of smartphones has left humans with such a short attention span that even a goldfish can hold a thought for longer. This is scientists. Researchers surveyed 2,000 participants in Canada and studied the brain activity specifically of 112 patients. The results showed that the average human attention span has fallen in 2000, the year 2000, the average human attention span has fallen from 12 seconds or around the time uh, in 2000 to 8 seconds. Goldfish have scientifically been proven to have an attention span of 9 seconds, more than humans. The research follows a study by the National Center for Biotechnology Information, and they have that uh, on, um, on file, and they say that most respondents in their survey said that they regularly dual screen while watching TV, trying to watch two programs at the, or sorry, two shows at the same time. What does James say about that? James 1.8 says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Unwavering is a thing we don't hear much about. Telephone was invented in 1876. First mobile phone, 1973. Now we can't go anywhere without the phone. GPS, our camera, it's our date book, our address book, our laptop, our weather, has encyclopedias in it. It's our shopping cart, our newspaper, magazines, our library. We use it for a uh, music player, TV. Uh, no, don't need a DVD player anymore or a Game Boy. Uh, ladies, it's your coupon book, your calculator, storage device, your wallet, your Bible, your calendar, your alarm clock, and you get the point. And all the while, we are overwhelmed with distraction. I'm going to skip that real quick. But listen to what Winston Churchill observed. He said, you'll never reach your destination if you stop and throw stones at every dog that barks. You will never reach your destination if you stop and throw stones at every dog that barks. What was he trying to say? What he was trying to say is, you have to stay focused in order to accomplish a task. So the first thing is to just look at your life and say, Lord, in my human relationships, in my relationship at, at home, uh, in my job that I'm doing, my service to you, and even my relationship to you, Lord, are distractions a problem? Number two, not only is it important to acknowledge that that's a problem, but I think it's important also to affirm your power over distractions. To affirm your power over distractions. Ecclesiastes says, whatsoever thy hand findeth to do, do it with thy might. As believers, we have been given all power. That's what we've been given. You have the authority because you're a believer and you have the ability to do amazing things. Not with your own power. Not with your own strength. Paul said, I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. If your favorite phrase is, well, I can't do anything about that. You need to nix that from your language. Because the truth is, with Christ's power, you can overcome anything. Paul said we're more than conquerors through him who loved us. The word he used there means super conquerors. You are spiritually, through Jesus, a super person. You can do amazing things. I hear this buzz phrase uh, around a lot now. My superpower. <laughs> How many have heard that? Is it just me? My superpower is. Well, our superpower is Jesus. And we can do anything. And oftentimes, when we look at our family dynamic, 
or we look at our, our marriage relationship, we say, you know, what can you do? I can't do anything about it. No, you can do a lot about it. You can do a lot about it. If your instinct is to live your life as a victim of circumstances, you will never, ever be victorious. So when you think about this matter of distractions, when you think about your life and there's a lot of craziness in it, okay, let's think about chopping out some of that craziness and getting down to the things that are meaningful and the things that are needful. I think last year was an important reset for me. It was an important reset here at church. I think it was an important reset for our family. Realizing that there are some things that are more important than just busyness. I mean, we can fill hours. Even at church, we can go through the motions of things and be busy and have a lot of activities. And it really made me pray and think about, Lord, what are the needful things? Are we doing things just to do things because we've always done things like that? Or are we doing things that are meaningful that count for eternity? The Bible says we're going to have to give an account for our time. What are we filling it with? If you insist on living life as a victim of circumstances, you'll not be able to be victorious. There are things that you can do. I'll just give you just a few thoughts. You can eliminate or reduce notifications on your phone. That's just a thought. Your phone, uh, you don't have to jump every time your phone dings. Um, you can get your spending in check so that you have more control over your finances. You can make a budget and plan your finances out. You say, Pastor, that's no fun. Yeah, it's no fun getting those overdraw notices. It's, it's so much fun getting those overdraft notices. <laughs> Spend quality time planning your life. Have a strategic approach. Don't let life just happen to you. You know, Jesus was never in a hurry, but he was always on time. And I'm sure the disciples must have been so frustrated with Jesus. But when Jesus prayed his high priestly prayer, he said this, I have finished the work that thou gavest me to do. Now, how many of us can say that? Not so much. Jesus laid down every night and he rested because he knew that in that day he had done exactly what his father wanted him to do. You know, a survey of mothers says that most mothers go to bed at night feeling like a total failure. How many of you ladies can relate to that? Pop your hand up, let's be honest. You feel like, you know, I went through the whole day, and at the end of the day, I just don't feel like what I did really mattered. You know, if you're doing what God wants you to do, whatever that is, if that's the dishes or folding laundry with your kids, whatever it is, you don't have to go to bed with that defeated feeling. Here's another thought. Stop flying by the seat of your pants. Have a plan and an approach. Make a plan and follow it. Schedule things. Make lists. Maximize your time. 1 Corinthians 14 says, Let all things be done decently and in order. How many days did God use to make the earth? How many days? Six days. If you notice the order of creation you notice how important the order of creation is. Let me show you something interesting. Let's take a peek at it. I'm just talking about God being a God of order and how important that is, that we learn how to order and organize our life.
Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 11. Are you ready? Genesis chapter number 1, verse number 11. This is the third day of creation. And God said, Let the earth bring forth grass, and the herb yielding seed, and fruit tree yielding fruit after its kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth grass, and herb yielding seed after his kind, and the tree yielding fruit, whose seed was in itself after his kind, and God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the third day. That's pretty cool, ain't it? God made all the grass and covered all the fields and everything that was a land. He, he covered that. Now notice day number four. If you don't think doing things in order is important or having a plan. Verse, day number four. And God said, read with me, let there be lights in the firmament. God made the grass first, then he made the sun. You ever put a board on grass? Ever lay a board down or a tarp? What happens after about a week? It starts getting yellow. And without that sun, no sun kills the grass. I think God was stressing here the importance of order. He made all the grass first, then he made the sun. So that kind of nixes the thousand day creation uh, the thousand year creation, some people say, well, the first day and then was a thousand years and then another thousand years. Because by the time day number four, after a thousand years, that grass would all been dead, okay? So it's an actual literal day-to-day -day creation. It's so important. God could have created the whole world with one statement, but he didn't. He did it in order. And then every evening he said that, well, that was good. And that was good. Plan your work, then work your plan. Get control of the things in your life and stop being a victim of circumstances. Number three, arrange your priorities. Arrange your priorities. Family. The time that you have as a family goes fast. And just when you think that things are going by fast, then they hit junior high and it just zooms. Make building relationships with your children and with your spouse a priority. Make it a big deal. You can let the TV raise your kids or you can raise your children. It's your choice. Ephesians 6, 4 says, And ye fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. It's talking about nurturing your children. Bringing them along. Take them with you. So I've got to run to the store. I'll load one of them in with you. And nurture them. That word nurture is tedious training and care. That's what that word means. And it takes time. That means making family time a priority. And I don't know what your schedule is, and I know what, don't know what time you have, but make time with family a priority. Uh, make the Lord's house a priority. King David was busy, I'm sure, but going to church wasn't an intrusion to him. He said, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. I've always said this, and I'll never stop saying it. Don't send your family to church. Take your family to church. So important. Don't give up ground. Learn how to serve the Lord together. That's important. For even as the Son of Man came not to be ministered unto, but to minister. For many years, we... As, as a family, we did tender care as a ministry, as a family. Now, I haven't asked my sons, and I'm sure they'll, uh, the truth will be known sooner or later. Probably tender care was not their favorite activity of the week. 
But it's something that we did as a ministry, as a family, so that we could minister to other people. There's a lot of things as a pastor that it's my job to do, but going to tender care as a family, that was a way that we could minister. It's so important, not only that you have time with family, that you make time for God's house, but make time to spend time with God. Make spending time with God a priority. Find a time, find a place, find a schedule, find some kind of regular rhythm that works for you to spend time with the Lord. I've been trying to meditate on verses and I have a little thing. Does anybody know what that little loaf of bread is with the verses in it? I can't remember what it's called, but I've been trying to meditate on a verse for the day and pulling that out and then reading it. And that's wonderful. But that doesn't take place of reading your Bible. It's important to make time to spend time with God. David said, evening and morning at noon I will pray and cry aloud, and he shall hear my voice. Isaiah 26 says, that will keep him in perfect peace, whose mind is stayed on thee, because he trusteth in thee. You have to put food in your mouth to nourish your body. And you have to put spiritual food into yourself to nourish yourself spiritually. But Jesus answered, but he answered and said, It is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Distractions. Think about that this week. Think about how you can prioritize your time, make your time important, so that you can do not only the needful thing, but to do the things that won't be taken away from you. When you die, you're never going to say, man, I wish I would have put a little more time in at the office. Nobody's going to say that. And I'm not saying be a slacker. When you're at work, you give 100%. But what I'm saying is, Jesus said, is not, life, is not life more than meat and the body than raiment? There's more to life than just earning a dollar. Let's make time for the things that are meaningful. Lifetime of labor is still worth.